Welcome, guys, to an episode, another episode of the Christian Buddy Show. I'm here with Lachlan. How are you feeling today, Lachlan? Good, thank you. So, your expertise is strength and conditioning. Do, do you mind expanding in a bit on your background and what you're up to at the moment? Sure. So, um, I'm a strength and conditioning coach from Melbourne originally, I'm currently working in the US. Um, the main group of athletes that I work with is predominantly uh, juniors, so 18 years of age and under, um, specifically tennis. Just given my tennis background, um, I use my uh, the knowledge that I've learnt and accumulated over the years um, into my um, background with tennis, um, and that's how I, I, I got into that. Fantastic. And what – I mean, I guess it's, it's interesting because – most people who have an interest in tennis, they end up being uh, just a coach. But what made you choose strength and conditioning specifically? So what made me choose strength and spe- uh, conditioning specifically was um, I got a degree from college. So I actually played um, in the US college system here. And my undergrad was in exercise and sports science. And then I furthered my education and I'm about to finish with a master's of exercise science through Edith Cowan. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got a, a big passion, um, for developing junior athletes and, you know, growing up, I didn't get a lot of that because it wasn't really known. The principles out there weren't really known for, you know, how do we help kids? How do we improve kids? Is it safe? And the, what the research is telling us now is that it is very safe to, um, to administer strength training for kids. And I, the, the youngest, uh, age that I work with is six. I have a six-year-old in there. And if you, if you look at a, a kid who runs, uh, the joint reaction forces going through their knee is far greater than what it would be to lift their body weight or even to lift uh, like a squat, to do a, a squat, for example, the most core foundational movement that there is. So, so I, like, I really want, yeah. Sorry, uh, I was just, so there is, so from what you're saying, it sounds like, uh, people are against young children lifting weights. Is that the consensus? And and you're saying that uh, that it's that it's not that that's not true. That um, in fact, like, where what's what's your knowledge? What what does this what does this the research that say on that? So over many years, the whole consensus has been that there's been a whole array of myths out there saying that uh, weightlifting stunt can stunt your growth. Um, it can it can do bad things to you, you know, as going into adulthood. But the research, what the research tells us is, we, the the biggest adaptations that 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 we get is is testosterone, right? And that happens when you hit puberty. They're the big strength. So if you or I went to the gym for adults, we'd get a testosterone boost um, as one of our adaptations. Now, in a in a kid who has not started puberty. Without that testosterone in their body, that endogenous testosterone in their bloodstream, there is no way that they're going to accumulate muscle mass. But then you might say, then how do they get stronger? If they're not, if they're not accumulating muscle mass, how do they get stronger? Well, here's the answer. It's, we actually get what we call central nervous system adaptations. So um, um. the firing from the brain to the muscle, the signal gets much stronger and the sequencing also um, becomes more efficient. So it's all central nervous system adaptations. Um, and then we use that foundation uh, from, a, from when you're a kid or as a junior athlete um, into um, your, the, your, your senior years as an athlete. Wow. Okay. So well, we've actually got a bit of a trick now at the moment. Um, so for people watching, we've got uh, some footage of, of Lachlan's training of his students. So I'm going to... Um, pull up one of the videos now do you mind just pro- going through some commentary some running commentary on this sure so this is one of my junior athletes um, she's top of her age group um, and what we're doing here is we're loading her into what we call an open stance forehand so I've used two boxes here and I've used that box on the right the bigger one so that she can drop her knee a lot lower and what we're doing is we're coiling the hips and we're releasing that right part of her body into the ball. And from a strength and conditioning perspective, we can say it's, we're using the stretch shortening cycle. So it's a very quick eccentric contraction followed by a concentric contraction. And 
when she loads that 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 right leg right we're creating power and that power is what puts the force into the ball yeah it's a very very uh tennis specific training there um, it, it is it is yeah. and you know you could put this on instagram or, or facebook and any sort of video and i think what coaches need to be aware of and, and can could cognizant of is that athletes can do these things but they've got to have the general foundations first so you you wouldn't mm. give this to somebody who doesn't have uh years of training experience so yes highly specific yeah and we've got another video here um so it looks like a bit of hill hill sprints or something here or um yes yes so that's just so when you look at strength and conditioning you've got the strength side and then you've also got the conditioning side as well and this really covers the conditioning side um of it so we want to um, we want to improve their metabolic output um by um by challenging their metabolic system here so a bit higher volume and when i say higher volume we're doing more repetitions more work um, now here, here it just looks like it's a basic sprint, which it is. Um, but when you do multiple sprints, so repeated sprints, then we are challenging the metabolic system as well. Um, so yeah. Cool. Um, so we've got the uh, the medicine, the typical. This is the so this is the stock standard. Um, you see all the professional. You see Andy Murray. He's I know, I've seen Andy Murray. Uh, you know, with the medicine ball. I think it's. Uh, yeah, so medicine oh. balls uh, can, are used in different settings, and the way I look at it, the big foundational principle in 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 for tennis is think of a canoe that's in water, yeah, and firing a cannon from that canoe. It wouldn't be very good because it's not very stable, right? Now yeah. imagine that canoe was in concrete, mounted in concrete. The ca the cannon that you're that you're firing <laughs> off is much more efficient because it has a bigger stable base. So in this video here, um, I've got a junior athlete who is, I'm getting into a, into a lunch his position. Footwork, sorry, sorry to cut you off there. His footwork is so fast, dude. Like he is, he is a machine, this guy. He's, is he's it, very is, quick. Is he, he is so quick. Um, so he's, uh, he's 14. He's 14 years old. Um, and I get him into a, a split lunge position because I want to improve his stability. So we're improving lower body stability while producing upper body power. Now, if his stability was poor, he wouldn't be able to produce as much power in, in his upper limbs. So that's why we want to improve the stability because in tennis, uh, when you when you produce power from a shot, you must be in a stable position. You see the likes of, of Nadal, Djokovic, Andre Rublev, they're all able to maintain a low base while producing power. You never see them um, straight legged, right? So they've always got a low center of gravity. Yeah, I mean, look at this. Look at this. This that that's that's bloody fast, dude. Like that's uh yeah, that's that's impressive. Uh, yeah. All right. So we've got uh, this looks very technical. This one, I can see. There's a few. Yeah. So what's happening on what's happening with this one? So just similar to the first video, loading him into an open stance backhand, and then he's rotating as well. So here he loads, and then when I get him into that lunge position, so you see where he lands. Yeah. That's that's so that's decelerating the body. His body is moving laterally, and then we're decelerating. So he's using his muscles, so glute med, glute min, he, uh, TFL, those abductor muscles abductor muscles eccentrically if they weren't working he would just t topple over think about a, a race car think about a, a lamborghini right that didn't that could not decelerate so it could, could accelerate in like 2.6 seconds or whatever from zero to 100 kilometers an hour but if it didn't have any brakes it wouldn't be efficient right so yeah. here we're, we're really um we're we're in trying to improve the brakes just like in a tennis shot you run out to a ball you have to decelerate and then recreate power. So if we go to this lunge position, right? We, we go back to the lunge. He's decelerated, and then I get him into a like a like a um, I guess like a power jerk position when he catches the bar overhead. So he's going from a stopping position, so he's decelerated. Then he reaccelerates, and then he has to stop again. So we're putting 
two or three different athletic principles within the one exercise. And then we've got the last one, which is, this is, okay. So it's almost like a similar type of loading very, up for the Very, very similar. Yes, yeah. yes. So in, the, in that lunge position, we're getting a um, strong athletic base here, and he's got to be able to hit a forehand or a backhand. Now, typically, obviously, you wouldn't hit a forehand or a backhand like that in real life. But the thing is that it, it does Maybe help. Maybe I do. I think, I, think I, hit, I think I'll hit my backhand. Sorry, I think I'll hit my backhand like that in real life. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's 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 great. So it's it it, it looks like um like these exercises you're you're creating. I mean, on the fly, and you're kind of tailoring it for the the, the specific needs of your students. And yes. So it's all it's all it's all specific. Now tennis um, does have very similar requirements, regardless of the player. Um, in the two videos you saw, you, you did see a senior athlete and then also a junior athlete. So the senior athlete already has a, a higher training background as well. So when you think about um, how you load exercises or how complicated you make them, it really varies based on the um, experience of the athlete. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for um, going into all that, that the strength side of things. Now, I guess it would be interesting to get your background um, maybe on more on a personal note. Uh, so how long have you been playing tennis for? I've been playing tennis since I was six. So I'm 28 now. So I guess that's uh, 20, 22 years. Because yeah, you, you're living it. You're not. You're not. You're, you're not in Melbourne anymore. And uh, and I think uh, like I think it's. For reasons of love, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you've moved to the United States now and um, it, it sounds like it, everything's working well for you at the moment. Um, yeah, so, so I've been here for the last uh, couple of years um, teaching as a teaching pro. They call them teaching pros here, teaching professionals, tennis coach, um, and then part-time as a strength and conditioning coach as well. So I, I do part-time um, for both, yeah. Yeah, right, okay. And... Okay, so what, what's what's the biggest challenge that that you face as a coach? So it's the biggest, biggest, yeah, no, it is a it is a difficult. Um, it's a loaded question, question. A little bit broad question, I know, but yeah. <laughs> Bro, okay, so, the, sorry, sorry. Let me, let me rephrase it. So, what's the biggest challenge for a a young child? I think you might have already covered it in the start of the podcast with the. Um. So a a young child who comes to tennis, for example. Uh, the, the biggest thing that you've got to realise is that they're out there to have fun and you've got to introduce them to the, to the love of the sport. Uh, and that's the biggest challenge that coaches get. It's not all outcome-based. Just because they can't hit 10 forehands or 10 backhands in a row, that's yeah. fine. Let them, let them enjoy sort of more what, let them enjoy what they're, what they're doing. Um, in the strength and conditioning side of things, um, I haven't had – it's been a joy working with six- to eight-year-olds. Um, it's it's been great. It, it teaches you that they can move just as efficiently as, as anyone out there. In fact, better because we do lose flexibility as we as we as we age. Um, so that's been a huge joy, a huge blessing. Watching the the benef the benefits of that. I hope that answers that. <laughs> no, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and what, what what's your opinion on yoga? In um, as a part of strength and conditioning for tennis, I think yoga is huge. I I should do it, but I, I don't. Uh, yoga is really good for mobility and flexibility. So if you look at if you look at uh, mobility, that's more joint mobility. So the the space between the joint um, and and the range within that joint space actually improves with yoga and mobility. Um, Flexibility, that's looking at muscle, how much um, the, the, the muscle can stretch, stretch, sorry, stretch. so muscle lengthening um, is also really important because if you think, if you look at a, a training load for an athlete, at the end of that week, their muscles are going to get tight because, because they've been worked, right? So we have to maintain that length of that muscle. We don't want it to get tight. We want to, mobility is huge. So yes, yoga once to twice a week. Is really important but now when you when you think about yoga you don't want to do it before training 
right? We want to do it after training. It's, it's very static, right? You do lose power from that muscle if you do it right at the beginning. It's just like static stretching, right? You look at footy players, for example, they're not all in a corner, you know, just stretching their hamstrings or stretching their glutes. They do that after the game. Yeah. But before the game, it's dynamic because we want to oh, get yeah. blood flow into the muscles. That's what we want. Static stretching is should be done. Now, 50 years ago, that's what they used to do. They used to do static stretching all the time. That was the warm-up. That was the that was the warm-up that we had to do when I was playing junior footy. Yeah. Yeah, times have changed. And is there any one best stretch that you recommend or is it all a bit of a muchness? It's all it, – it, it, it's it doesn't really – doesn't really matter. Uh, so the big muscle groups, when you think about it, is are your glute muscles. So the gluteals, um, the hamstrings, they're the they're the, really the powerhouse muscles of the body, pretty much within any sport. So they have the they're met metabolically taxed the highest, right? And they use the most strenuously. So they need to be stretched, or they've got to be given the most attention as well. Yeah. Um, so. Most parents, most kids know what they are. They've done them before. Um, so glutes and hamstrings, when you're look, looking at the hips and the knees, right, those muscles join to um, attach to one or more joints, so the knee and the hip, which is therefore why we have to stretch both joints at the same time, gives us the best outcome. Now, I want to end the debate with you on this podcast, hopefully, but do I need big biceps to play tennis? Is that is that uh, you know? I see these guys in the dial, and even Zverev, he's wearing the um, the tank tops. He's flexing all over the court. I mean, is this is this uh, a, a thing that we need to be aware of? Or so the the plain and simple blunt answer to that is a big capitalized no. <laughs> all right. So if you look at the bicep, the action of the of biceps just does this. It just bends. It just pretty much bends your elbow. That's the only point of it. The biggest things that, that we need to focus on is working the posterior chain. So glutes and hamstrings are huge. In injury prevention and, and force reduction is the glute and the hamstring muscles. Right? That's how you get power. Having a bigger bicep is not going to make you hit a bigger forehand or a better backhand. Right? So what what gives you power in, uh, in tennis Christian? It's, it's, it's sound biomechanically correct technique and the ability to produce force from the ground up, right? So your kinetic chain comes from your feet, ends when the racket hits the ball. Having a bigger bicep does not uh, equate to a better shot. Damn, I've been doing all these curls. I, I, I want to look like Nadal, you know, so I guess that kind uh, of... It's good. If you want to go to the beach and look good, then uh, <laughs> then you, you can hit the bicep curls, but I've never done a bicep curl with uh, any of the um, athletes that I work with. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. All right. Um, so, okay. So, I know that, yeah, so the, because I mean, when you look at Djokovic, like when you look at the, uh, I guess, the top players, by example, you see Djokovic um, and Federer and I guess Nadal's a bit of an exception, but their body, uh, it's it's very, it's very lean, um, it's almost like a soccer player. Uh, you, you, like they have the strong, yeah, strong quads, calves, and just uh, very lean up top. Like even um, Medvedev, he's very wiry. He's very flexible. Like you can see his stretch. Um, there's not, yeah, there's not many heavy players, except for Nadal. I think Nadal's maybe a bit of an exception to that. Um, no, no. So mm -hmm. yeah, you, I mean, you are you are right. If you look at the physique of maybe Cristiano Ronaldo and and Roger Federer, they they do look similar because the metabolic demands of both sports are similar. So it's 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 you work and then you rest, right? Now in in tennis, you cannot you cannot be too heavy, right? Like you no. do not want to be heavy. That's what I mean to say. You don't want to be. You do want to be light because if you're heavier it makes it much harder for your body to push off. Tennis is a single-legged sport requiring multiple bursts of power. Now, if you weigh kilos, right, how much harder is it to push off the ground? It's much harder. In tennis, you have to be able to move off the ground 
So you've got to produce force into the ground, land, and then reapply that force. And being overweight is very difficult to do. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's a lot easier, as you said, to be leaner. Yeah. And I know that your, your, your expertise is in strength and conditioning, but can you speak anything into nutrition or you'd, you'd prefer not to? Uh, you'd, I you mean, wanna... so we can't give, we can give recommendations, but not really, you know, recommend, um, nutritional advice um, as, as it speaks. So if, okay, if anyone, okay, let me... I, I I'll, always I'll recommend it to a, to a nutrition or a dietitian, but. Okay. I'll rephrase the question. Uh, what, during your tournament experience, what did you used to drink and eat? Um, what did you used to drink during games uh, to help your energy levels? Um, so if I can break it down, I'll, I'll answer it this way. So you've got two different types of carbohydrates, right? You've got complex carbohydrates and then you've got yeah. simple carbohydrates. Just so the audience sort of understands the difference between sure. between the two, the complex yeah. carbohydrates break down much slower. So that's why we call low glycemic index foods. So if it breaks down slower, you want to have that sort of food like wheat bread or brown bread, wholemeal bread, um, pastas, a long time before the match starts. So maybe the night before, six to eight hours before the match. Now during the match, we want we do want simple sugars. So they're simple, single sugar units. So that means they break down very quickly and you get the energy right then and there. So I used to have like glucose tablets. Um, you could also have a Powerade or Gatorade um, gives you um, glucose on the spot. Um, even after a match, you do want to re replenish um, your, your glucose stores your, in your bloodstream quickly. But yeah, as I said before the match, we, we want um, carbohydrates that's stored in the form of glycogen in the liver and the muscle, and that takes time to build up. So the night before, um, something with uh, complex carbohydrates, it could even be oatmeal the morning of, of your match, but as, the, now, as you get sorry, closer to the match, yeah. What's the, because um, I always get confused, how much time should I leave, but just say my first match is at 10 a.m., when should I be eating my first meal? Your match time is at 10 a.m. I would, I mean, I would probably try seven, seven thirty would be your just first meal, give, and then just give the body time to in the... between. Yeah. Yes, okay. <clears throat> snacks in between. Okay. Would be would be the most. So you you have to keep drinking water as well before the match. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's 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 funny because. Like I was watching another podcast with a, uh, a CrossFitter and they were talking about nutrition and um, this guy was just eating Snickers bars and drinking heaps of Gatorade and, um, you know, it's just crazy, this, the advice on nutrition these days. It's, um, it's very bizarre. I would so, highly recommend you to anyone to stay away from Snickers bars or Kit Kats because it's just processed. It's processed sugars. And anything that's processed is really th – these things are processed simply so that they can stay on the shelf for longer, so they have a, a longer shelf life. That's all – that's, that's why. I used, to, I used to know a coach that used to drink flat Coke uh, in between games. Is that <laughs> – that probably falls a so, bit. I mean, I'm not – I'm not necessarily – I mean, Pat Rafter has done that before, I've seen, um, and, and Coke has a lot of sugar in it. So – um, if you need sugar that quickly, you know, players have drink, drank Coke um, in the past just to get that big sugar rush. But the problem is, like, that's, how long does that rush really last for? It's like five or ten minutes and then, bang, crash. So they take it strategically. Like, if you're six or in the third, yeah, you might drink the Coke there because you know the tie is only going to last 10, 15 minutes, and that's all you need it for. I wouldn't be taking it during the first game. Okay, so I'm reading between the lines there. So, you, yeah, you can't – yeah, okay. So, uh, strategic intake of Coke. Flat. And um, we've got we've got a Brizzy, Brizzy Badass 888 drink pickle juice. So, that's another uh, – I've heard pickle juice is actually – yeah, that's – I don't know what the science behind it is, but I, I've heard I've heard good things about pickle juice. I'm not a, I'm not a nutritionist. So, look, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't – I've never drank, drank, had pickle juice. I don't even like pickles. But, I mean, there could be a point – you know, there could be science. There's probably science and 
data out there to support the use of pickle juice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Who's your favourite player? So my favourite player, and it, and it always has been, is uh, Roger Federer. Just due to his, I, I, I think he's one of the most down to earth sports um, people out there. Uh, he's just, he's just such a good sport. His, his sportsmanship is just, you know, second to none. And that, and that's why, and probably he's probably the most talented player out there as well. He's been so consistent through throughout his whole career. Yeah. Uh, now I've got a bit of a controversial que- controversial question. Uh, I've had a bit of a backlash from most of my audience on this one, and it it's the tennis goat. Most people say there is no tennis goat. Some people say it's Djokovic, Federer, and Nadal. I want to get your take on that. I hope you you've got an opinion on this one. So, due to the fact that Roger Federer is my favourite player, I don't have you know no bias, no implicit bias here, a bit. Um, yeah, Federer, in my eyes, is the GOAT. It really just depends on what angle you want to sort of look at it. Um, you can look at it from an outcome perspective, so who's won the most. Uh, I also look at it as a character perspective. Federer's probably got the most, the best character, in my yeah. opinion. Um, he, has been, he, he hasn't been world number one for the longest, um, but when you look at a 37-year-old or a 36-year-old uh, winning two Grand Slams in a year. I don't know if that's ever been done you know, before, especially not in the last 30 years. Um, the, the way that he plays and moves at, at, at his age is, is incredible. And, and that's why he's, he's, he's the best player of all time in, in my eyes. Awesome. Okay. And kind of, I want to kind of take it back to the, the tennis training realm. Um, what, what about footwork? Is there any uh, – I know that you were big into the Bailey's method or do you have anything to speak into that? Oh, so, yeah, so David Bailey, he's based in Parkland, Florida. He's Australian um, from Sydney and he, he came up with his own method and it's based on how you contact the ball. So as I was alluding to before, there's different stances, open stance, closed stance. So how – how do you get into a specific stance based on the shot that's coming to you? So he's kind of David's kind of alluded to a tactical perspective based on the way that you contact the ball. So if somebody, for example, if someone gives you a, a deep heavy ball, right, you're going to use what's called a back foot hop because it's going to allow the ball to, to go back deep. Now, um, on the flip side to that, if it's a short ball, you can go into a front foot hop. So your, your body weight's going forward and you're hopping off the front foot, right? So I, I, I mean, I do do that in, in my lessons as well. And um, I think that's really, really important. Um, it can make a huge difference because kids simply don't know footwork in a sense of coaches really only focus on what happens from the hip up to the head, right? So they just look at that. That's the only thing that a lot of coaches look at. While in despite of that, they neglect what happens from the hips down to the feet. Right, so if you're in the wrong position, you can have the best technique in the world. But if you're not in the right position, well, the ball's not going to go in. So here coaches are trying to keep refining the upper body, what they do with the racket, with the take back, with the follow through, with the brush up. That can all, that's not even the issue here. The big issue is that they're not in the right position. And that's a key component of, of tennis. Not just tennis, but you know all sports, you need good positioning and, and proper footwork. Yeah, and is there any practical? I mean, I know skipping is 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 pretty popular. Is there any practical yeah. things that you can recommend That's, to improve? Yeah, great, great question, there, Christian. So, it, when you look at like skipping and cones and and ladders, to me, that's not really footwork. That's coordination. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it's good to for skipping to to improve coordination and and get the blood pumping and that sort of thing. But that's not going to help positioning. As much on a on a tennis court, you need to make it specific. Um, to you, you have to make it specific. So you actually have to go out and play that sport, um, and have coaches kind of help with help you with it during, for example, during a tennis lesson. 
All right, we've got another question coming in from our live viewers. So this is Breezy Badass again. How do you become a goat at tennis? How to, how to become the greatest <laughs> uh, of all time? <laughs> Just win a just win 20, 20 plus grand slams. <laughs> you have to win twenty plus grand slams. That's probably the, uh, the answer there. You have to win twenty uh, plus grand slams and retire at the age of maybe forty two. <laughs> I, uh, uh, but on, on a serious note, I think I think this person is asking, like, you know, how do you, how do you become good? How do you be that good? And I think it's uh, the big debate is, are you born a champion or or not? And and the big, I think the answer to that is, you're not born a champion. You have to have the right sort of genetics and the talent, but then you've also got to have the drive and the persistence that's never ending. Um, and, and keep improving from, you know, from a young age, really. So you've got to be, you've got to be driven. And I see kids who are there because the parents want them to be there, not necessarily the kid. And then I also see kids who are extremely driven as well. And, and the hard thing about that, Christian, is you can get the most talented player out there, but they get lazy. And because they're so talented, they do get lazy because they get away with it. Um, and then you see the kids who aren't talented, who work their butt off every single day, every single night, trying to get better. The best combination is when you have a talented athlete who give 110% every time they go out there and they've got that work and they, they've got that drive in them. They've got, they've got a purpose. They've got something to strive for and to achieve as well. And yeah. they're the best kids. They're the kids that you really want to work with. Yeah, I think that's the the recipe for champions. Uh, like you see, um, uh, like top of my head, Khabib Nurmagomedov. I don't know why he's 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 from UFC, but um, like I guess like th- these guys, yeah. Like when you see great champions like that, that's the recipe. Uh, it's like the genetics, the tra- the uh, the work ethic, the talent. It's all combining into one. Yeah. Now I don't watch UFC, but. Take it from this perspective. Um, so Federer has won everything in tennis, pretty much. He's got a net worth of like four hundred million dollars. Yet, I mean, he could retire if he uh, he could have retired fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, right after he won his first slam. But he's still determined. He's still got the drive, as if he just first started. And that and that speaks volumes because you see so many juniors out there. They think they're talented, which they probably are. Um, but they're like, yeah, they get cocky. They don't need to give it as much effort. You see players like Nadal and Federer, like they're still going at it at, and they're like 35 plus. So it, it speaks volume. It's the love of the game that really drives you forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you touched on something there before, uh, genetics. How, how much of a, a, a factor is genetics in, in the game of tennis? I mean, genetics is huge. And if you look at, uh, there have been studies to say, you know, what's, what's the right height for tennis? What's the most ideal height? And I think it came to six foot one. And you see Federer and Nadal are both six one. Um, and that gives you a combination of speed and also power. If you look at someone like John Eisner, for example, I can't remember his exact height. I think he's 6'10 or even 6'11. Um, now, he's got the biggest surf probably in the game. And he has for the last 10 years. But he can't move like Diego Schwartzman can. Diego Schwartzman like is like five seven or five eight, right? So there's a trade off. Do you want a massive serve for just from being tall, right? Or do you want to move well? So you want to kind of get a blend between the both. And I think six one is the magical number, um, which is ob- obviously based on genetics um, to to get to. And you see, Federer he's got a, he does have a big serve. It's not like John Eisner or Kevin Anderson. Yeah, but on the it, trade-off, he, can't, he moves like he moves incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, Nick Kyrgios, what's your opinion? <clears throat> I think Nick Kyrgios is one of the most talented players in the on the ATP tour. Um, he's, he's of course he's controversial, but Nick's going to go away, uh, go about the things that he does. I think he brings great entertainment. I think he's great for the game. Um, yeah, as I said, his talent is is limitless um he could probably be in the top five if he if he wanted to but nick said time and time you know before that winning grand slams for him is not the top of his priority i know that nick um goes about his business differently and um at the end of the day he says that he's an entertainer 
Um, and it, it frustrates everyone else that he's not reaching his best potential. And he knows that. I mean, undoubtedly, so he knows that, that he's not reaching his best potential because uh, for whatever the reason is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see Nick Kyrgios win a slam. But if it's not, in, if, you know, if it's not, in, if it's not, and as this person has just commented, I hate Nick because he's better than me. He's talented than most people. <laughs> and to see someone throw it away is frustrating. Um, but, you know, he's, he's entitled to, to do that. So, but if 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 any chance uh, someone knows Nick that's watching, or um, yeah, by any chance, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put your um, I'm going to put your Instagram handle up here so he can get in touch with Lachlan, and you can train Nick Kyrgios. You can have a that could, that can be something for your resume there. Put a professional ATP because I I know just from watching him, he's got uh, he's got a trainer in in his box, the guy with the glasses. I kind of seen him there and um i think you would do a much better job lucky at lachlan and um i well i'm humbled to to for you to say that <laughs> i think i think in nick's box he needs you know you can have the best strength and conditioning coach in the world but if you can't relate to that player then there's no point in having them in the box and i think you know nick's got he, he's chosen chosen his team for players he needs a team around him who can relate to him because don't forget i mean before COVID, he's traveling you know, 40 weeks of the year he's traveling so he needs a good team yeah, around him. It's... So, you know, I he that's what you need. And I think being away from home and travelling for tournaments that, that long is it's it's tough mentally. So yes, he does he's he's put um, the right people that he thinks is the right right fit for his team. But if he ever asked me, I'd be uh, I'd be totally honored to work with a player like Nick. <laughs> Absolutely. And Kind of segueing into the mental side of tennis, I'm curious to get your opinion on this. How 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 big does the mental side of tennis play into things? The so mental side is huge, and um, when I did podcasts last year, I spoke to like Luke Seville, Mark Pullman's, um, Aaron Addison, who's now playing UTR tournaments. He said there's not much difference between a player ranked maybe 80 in the world and 300 in the world. And they talk about the 1% differences that um, can determine a match. And I think the mental side is absolutely huge. Your your mental controls everything about how we perceive stress. Tennis is a game of stress. You're playing yep. one point for so much. Think about a sudden death deuce or a 10-point tiebreaker. Um, how you play under pressure is huge as well. So, yeah, the, the mental side of things, I think, can get a player going from futures to the top 100 or just sort of staying stagnant and then quitting, yet when they could have gone so much further. Um, mental, the mental side is something that's often neglected and just simply not practised by, by many players. Yeah, because you see in the, in the low-level AMTs, Australian money tournaments, like you see a few um, old cagey players and they play these mental tricks on you like I'll give you an example. Like I was playing one of the tournaments, and uh, I, I was—I think I, I just broken this player, and I was kind of up in the set, and he kind of started to, you know, get in my head a little bit. He started to be really friendly with me. He was kind of, you know, talking, uh, you know, asking me all these personal questions, and then I felt like he was my best friend. And then I did—I there was that—I lost the competitive edge. I felt, yeah. I felt, and uh, yeah, tennis is so mental. It's, and, um, and players will do that to you. Even if um, anyone from Victoria is, is, is watching this, um, you see that in men's pennant as well. Um, <laughs> now, if you, you haven't experienced that, then it, it, it can get to you. But, you know, if, if someone's going to be friendly with you, I mean, you know, you can be friendly with them back. Yeah. Don't let it, don't let it um, change your game. So, don't let like, it change your game. you know, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all people. Um, if they want to socialize with you, I'm sure they can do it after the match. <laughs> but you know, you've signed yeah, up for yeah. you've signed up to be for a competition, and you should give your best efforts, regardless of you know what's being said. So yeah, as, uh, going back to your question, Christian, I think the mental side of it is is paramount, absolutely paramount. Meditation. Any, Meditation. Any? I've I've never done it. I, I I don't I don't meditate. I I I've heard that it's really helpful because it calms your mind. Um, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of players. I heard Djokovic did was doing meditation. I could be wrong, but that's from what, I, no. what I've heard. And meditation is a very powerful um, tool to use. 
I heard that yeah, Djokovic was meditating two hours a day. He he was doing like some experiment or, or some crazy thing. Yeah, but I I personally meditate and and I feel sometimes it's a, there's 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 a balance there's a payoff there's a balance. Uh, sometimes you can become too relaxed, too calm, and I think you, you want to find that balance between. I think Federer once said uh, you want to find the balance between fire and ice. Where you where you where you're still motivated and charged up, but you don't allow that to um, overcome. You know you don't you know yeah. you're not overcome with the emotions. And yeah. I like the um, I call it the U analogy. So if you picture the the a, a big U, the letter U, and you've got on one side you've got under aroused, and then the other side you've got over aroused, and you want to be in between. And everyone, everybody is different. It's really based on personality and your characteristics. So if you're a very fiery sort of person, let's just say you're an extrovert and you get really, really pumped up, that's not like think like you. That may not be a good thing um, if you if you're over aroused too much. So you want to find the balance. So someone like Leighton Hewitt, it doesn't take much to get pumped up. But then you might look at a quieter player. Um, I don't know if you remember like Chris Guccione, who's playing doubles. He's, he's a quieter player. It takes him a long time. It takes him a, a much more effort to get pumped up. So finding that arousal zone would take um, might take him maybe a little bit longer. I'll tell you who's a good example of that. Uh, Yannick Sinner. Uh, his 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 yes. court demeanor is just fantastic. You never see him flustered. I've, I've, I don't think of. He's only made like I've only seen him being angry once. You know. It's yeah the 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 control is is yeah yeah he's he's mental as you were saying his mental side is just fantastic he you can't tell if he's won a point or if he's really lost a point um, and and it's something that I also say about Andre Agassi if you remember Andre Agassi playing we were, we would have been young kids and he, his reaction was the same after every single point which is difficult for the opponent because as an yeah. As in, the opposition wants to see you angry. If I'm playing a player and they're getting upset, that's good for you, right? Because it means what you're doing is working. It's Yeah, it's feedback, but, yeah. Right. Yeah. So they're giving you feedback like, I'm going to let you in, I'm going to let you beat me because whatever you're doing is working. I'm frustrated. You've got me. But if they do nothing, it's kind of, oh, hang on a minute. Like, is this, I'm, I'm winning some points, but, you know, is what I'm doing working? Yes. Yeah, I that's that's one of my biggest weaknesses. That's what I'm working on consciously at, at the moment with my game. I'm trying to um really focus on my breathing, and I feel like when I focus on my breathing, just in through the nose, out through the mouth, and just and really um just relax and loosen up. I feel like I don't have as many outbursts, and I've never broken a racket, so I'm happy with that. So I always throw uh, my I've, racket up. I don't break. I don't break. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I haven't I've broken a racket before, and I'm, I'm, I am proud to say that. Um, I think, you know, after you've played a strenuous point and your um, your sympathetic nervous system is just going crazy, your adrenaline's pumping, yeah. and you do have outbursts. So the, the thing with breathing is to trying to get your heart rate down to a, a lot, um, to like your what your heart rate was before you started the point, and that's going to make you much more relaxed. And less like less emotional as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so, do you have any practical advice? Like, how? What? What would you recommend for players that are a bit more frustrated? How to calm it? How to kind of rein it in a little bit? What? What's your advice? I uh, so think of it like a memory, right? Every time you get mad you're more likely to do it again, right? But yet the way to do it, and I've heard sports psychologists say this, is when you get the urge of throwing your racket or getting mad or getting frustrated, you let it, you let it, you feel the emotion, but then you just let it stop, right? You don't react to it, right? Then if it happens again, you feel it, you feel the emotion go through your body. We're all humans, we get emotional, but don't act on it, right? Just keep going. And over time, we see you're less likely to do it. So we do, we're like deleting that urge. We're deleting the response every time that we do it. Well, that's a, yeah, fantastically said. Yeah. Uh, and we've just got a con- bit of a controversial comment come through. The goat of tennis, 
We've got him on the show now. No, no, no. Getting mad is okay. So I think uh, I think yeah, I think there's a happy medium. I think there's a there's a balance that tennis players uh, need to find. But uh, if you're yeah. gonna get, you see players who might break who break a racket, but it gets them more pumped up. So like you might see like a Wawrinka, he breaks a racket, but it doesn't affect him in the wrong way. So it actually pumps him up even more. Um, so yeah, there 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 is a balance of of how you do it. Um, but I don't like breaking rackets or I don't even like seeing rackets getting broken. So, I mean, there's so many kids out there who can't afford a racket and, you know, it's not the racket's fault. As Tony Nadal says, it's not the right racket's fault that you missed a shot. It's your fault. Um, the racket doesn't deserve to ever get smashed. <laughs> Absolutely. And we've actually got a special guest on, Jimmy Connors. I hope that, I, w- I wish he could join the stream, but he's... <laughs> So uh, Jimmy Connors actually he he's got a very uh, well well known record. Uh, he's 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 done well with his with himself. So um, <laughs> we the comments are going nuts here at the moment. Um, it's it's uh it's 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 fantastic. Yeah, I think if you look at the the Connors McEnroe era, they they were great for the game, but they used to get into their opponent's head by acting the way that they used to act. I, I honestly don't even think that they were angry. I'd love to ask him, but I don't actually think they were angry. It used to just to get them self-fired up. That's what they used to do. That's how they used to go about their game. Uh, you might even see it in Australian rules football where players get fiery. And it's not that they're angry or anything like that. They just want to get themselves fired up, you know. So, yeah, as you said, it's based on personality. It's, um, yeah. it's basically just how you go about it, yeah. So let me give you uh, like a practical example. Like let's say it's six all in a tie break um, and I'm feeling really tight. And um, should I still be going for my shots? Should I still be going for that forehand if it's there? And because I, I know that's sometimes people uh, s- uh, slow down their – they slow down their swing. Um, can you speak anything into that? I think it depends on the opponent that you're playing. If your opponent hits a lot of errors and is bad, you know that they're bad under pressure, they've done some silly shots under pressure, then you can be a, play a little bit more conservatively. Uh, if you know that they're you know, not going to miss, I, I think, and if they're playing hesitant, then that's when you can go and attack. Because even though you might miss a few points here or there, at the end of the day, you're going to win the match. You're going to win more points. Um, it's going to get them more frustrated because they know that you're handling the pressure better. If you can go for your shots, I think that's better. Nothing, I wouldn't go for anything silly, but um, I think going for your shots is a good thing, especially under pressure. You watch Rafa at six all in the third. He doesn't look any different to when he's playing. He treats every, all the points are the that's, same. Yeah. Dominic Team is a good example of that. That that one-handed backhand down the line under pressure, that's, that's fantastic to watch. Yeah. Yeah, it... Like I'll give you an example. Like I, I had we started the pennant season and um, I, the first set I lost the match, but I was up the first set. Um, it was a tiebreaker. I was up three one in the first set, and then my opponent lifted his level, and I, I made a few errors, and he, yeah, he just took the, the first set tiebreaker, and that was it. Like it was, uh, it was interesting how up, he. So, sorry, three one in the you were up three one in the breaker. I was up three one, and my it's interesting because my opponent lifted his level. Uh, he really started to go for his shots and hit really deep shots and took me out of my comfort zone. So tennis is a game that can change in a blink of an eye, and that's two points. So when you're up three one, four one, even five one in a tiebreaker, like you've got to you've got to treat that you're down. You've got to you have to keep playing. It's not over until you win that last point. All right. Yeah. So you have to lift your game at three one when you're three one up. You know, if you were three one down, you might have won it because you would have raised your game. You'd be like, "Oh crap! Like I'm, I'm down here. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to rise here." It's almost like you shouldn't be worried about the score. You should be. I think um, some there's a few books on this, but uh, it's like, yeah, you just need to worry on the process and 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 what you're capable of doing. Don't yeah. be. Um, you have to. You have to take care. Of, it's just the process. Worry about the process, not the destination. Um, there's a lot of good quotes out there. That, that says that because when we start worrying about the destination, we forget about how to get there. And that's, that's what gives us, that's what puts us down the wrong, you know, the wrong path, the, the path that we don't want to go down. So you have to worry about the process of, you know, how to get there. And the results will come. If you worry about the process, um, the results will come. 
No worries. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, nice words there, Brizzy. Badass. This podcast is nice to watch. Um, you should you should be telling if you, are, you, are you from where are you if you're in America. Wh- so, which state are you in at the moment, Lachlan? I'm in I'm in Mississippi, so um, I'm in the southern part. Um, it gets very hot. It's like summer, like eleven months of the year. It's really, it's hot. It's like almost like Queensland. <laughs> oh, he's from uh, he's from Tennessee. So I was gonna, I could have yeah. got you some clients there, but uh, he's he's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and uh, Jimmy Connors is in Colorado. So um, all right. yeah, no, Tennessee is the state above. Oh, it's a state above. Maybe can you make a trip down or? Uh, or it's maybe? about oh, it's about four or five hour drive. <laughs> And speaking of America, like, what's the uh, like? How, how does it compare to the Australian tennis system? Like, what's in in yeah? Because I know you play college so tennis. If you so from the coaching perspective, in in America they they're called teaching professionals. So most of the time they're on a salary, so um, they get benefits and that sort of thing. Whereas in Australia, when I was coaching in in Melbourne, a lot of the coaches are uni students so their whole life's objective as a job is not to become a tennis coach it's to do something else they just do coaching to supplement some income so would you what would you rather a a university student who just feeds balls and they might know a little bit about tennis and doesn't want to be a coach that's the thing they don't want to be that's not what they want to end up Mm -hmm. or a tennis professional a teaching professional who does that as their career and that's that's the biggest difference. So in the US and even in Europe, there's much more money in tennis coaching, because they've got they've got what we call country clubs, right? So there's a lot more money fed into the system. Now, if, I, if I look at it, the other um, a different approach, so um, kids growing up, um, parents here spend much more money on their kids um, to get good, and I think it sometimes it's it can be a little bit too much. Um, but at the, at the end result, if you become a very good tennis player or baseball player, um, you can get a college scholarship. So basically, you can go and get a university education for free. You know, if you're if you're if you're good enough, and that's why a lot more money goes into the um, to junior tennis and junior development um, at a young age. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, I know. I think uh, Andy. I think Andy Murray. Uh, he was his his parents sent him off to a Spanish academy, and I know it's just so just the money that's 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 needed for development is 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 crazy. If you want to become a professional, it is. It is, and yeah. So he went to Sanchez Casal, which is a world renowned tennis academy. They've got um, campuses, you know, in the states, in Europe, um, but. Yeah, the money that goes into it, you can see the cost of like the IMG Academy, or um, there's other academies that cost up to fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. So they board them, they live there full time, and the amount of money that would go into that from starting upon graduation would be at least millions. And imagine having brothers and sisters also going to that same academy. Um, the cost is is outrageous, um, and. I always ask myself, you know, is that the best route? Is that the best method? Because not all players on the ATP tour did go to an academy. There's players who didn't go to an academy. I, I don't even think Federer went to an academy. He might have. I'm not sure. But um, you know what I'm saying? Like that that might not be the, you know, more, the answer. It'll, it come, there's so many other factors that um, break it down. Do you have any practical advice? If, um, if I, let's say I have a child and I want to make, this child the next champion like what what what's the uh what 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 do i need to put in place to make that happen so the first thing is do you want them to be pro or does the child want to be pro and that's, <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. the that's the that's the big question yeah. the child says you yeah, look i want to i want to do this i want to be a professional tennis player i'm ready to work hard i let them know what it's going to take it's going to take a lot of hard work because there's so many other people who want to be just as good or if not better and the, the big things you've got to put in place, I think, is um, they have to have good motor skills. They have to have be a good all-rounded athlete. So starting off with different sports, don't go so specific. At, at six years old, you don't need to be playing 15 hours of tennis a week. That's not going to make – that will that'll lead to burnout. So does the kid play soccer, football, 
hockey maybe, cricket, get them to see different sports because a lot of skills in sports can be transferred into other sports. Yeah. I think having a good general physical program, general preparation program is good as well. Learning physical skills. So can they learn to squat, hinge, um, press, pull, learning different athletic movements. Um, lifting movements is paramount as well. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think you should be so specific at a at an early age. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, and, and kind of coming full circle from what, what we mentioned at the start of the podcast is uh, what, which I found interesting, which you've which I've kind of learned um, with young players, you can't they haven't got that testosterone, they haven't got they haven't hit that puberty section, so uh, you, yeah, you need to be training the the nervous system. I think that's that's a real. That's an interesting part that you that you mentioned there. Yeah, so we call it neural sequencing. So if you look at a basic squat, you're utilizing multiple joints to get in the, to get into the movement that you want to get into. Um, so you're also training the the nervous system to move in a particular way. Um, so yeah, that, that's a huge neural component um, before even loading it, before even getting them to hold like a ten kilo. Um, dumbbell or a five kilo dumbbell all right we've got a question from one of the viewers what's your favorite sport to play <laughs> it's an obvious well one, isn't it? <laughs> well, well it, it, i would say you know growing up it, it is tennis but like when, when you're when you're coaching um as, a, as your job sometimes the last place i want to be is on the tennis court <laughs> um but there are other racket sports that i like i like playing ping pong and um pickleball is a sport that's um very popular here in the us it's not as common yeah. in australia that's when you play on a smaller court um that's a lot of fun as well if you ever want to google that or watch it on youtube that's that's pretty fun too um but then i i also uh i enjoy watching australian rules football as well i'm a collingwood fan so yeah <laughs> oh okay I think I don't know if they're doing too well. Are they? I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, yeah, we might wrap it up there. We've almost hit the hour mark, and um, yeah, guys, uh, how can people how can people connect with you online if they want to train with you or just follow you on social media? How can they do so? Sure. So um, my business name is um, Puyol. So my last name, Puyol Athletic Development and Performance. Um, I don't have a website yet, but that's something, you know, it's in the future that I'd like to, to sort of set up. Um, and then my email is Puyol ADP. So P-U-Y-O-L-A-D-P um, at gmail.com. And um, yeah, feel free to um, DM me any questions on Facebook or to is that send correct? me an email. I've, just put, it up on the, I've yeah. just put it up on the screen there. Is that correct? Yep, that's yeah, that's right. Yep, yep, that's right. So there you are, guys. We've got three people watching at the moment. So if you're uh, watching, you can get on that. And um, yeah, shoot me. Don't be, don't be, don't hesitate to any, to ask me any uh, you know, any relevant questions. Um, you know, for fitness training or, or tennis training, I'd um, be more than willing and uh, happy to help out um, the best that I can. Well, it's been a good chat. And uh, guys, don't forget to subscribe to my channel as well. So, um, all right. Lucky no worries. Uh, enjoy, enjoy your day, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for having me.